Welcome back everybody to your daily update on the state of um, what will soon be no longer a peaceful Kurald Galen or something like that. Um, yeah, after I took a break yesterday and only rambled about Discworld, seriously, go join us on the Discworld um, reread um, or read along thing. <laughs> but apart from that, um, let's go back into Forge of Darkness, uh, part four, Forge of Darkness, chapters four of that like 16 and 17 i didn't manage more today because busy and shit like that anyway let's have us ramble about that and i hope i remember everything because i spent my day dealing with all kinds of shit and all the stuff i read this morning while working out has settled in my brain because of other stuff <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want to ramble about like the um the problems of vinyl production in the 21st century. Um but let's let's talk about <laughs> Forge of Darkness. <laughs> Seems more sane. Here we go. That was unsatisfying. Cheers. All right, so things are getting more and more interesting and um, escalating more and more. Um, we spent a lot of time this time around in Jagut country and Azathanai country and whatnot. And um, yeah, that's going to be interesting to look at. Um, so I kind of... See, I'm confused. <laughs> uh, no, I get it. All right, so we find out what um, the... <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of, like, argumenting and stuff that I'm going to go into in a minute. But basically, we find out what um, Draconis plans to do, like, get, like, a weapon made out of knight or something like that. Like, a knight bound in place, and he asked Erastus to do it, and he needed blood for that, or he thought he needed blood for that, and that's why he killed Hood's wife. <laughs> or beloved. I am somewhat unsure. But it, you know, stuff. And, yeah, there's problems going to come from that, and we just know there's going to be problems coming from that. And then... Draconis suffers from some of those problems, and then we'll see where that goes. And then, obviously, on the other side, we have that whole Civil War thing escalating further and further and further um, with all the bad things that um, connect to that. So, let's talk about a theory. So, I'm, I'm just going to drop this, and I'm pretty sure I might be wrong. Or others have thought of it before. So when I read this today, and there's this part in chapter 4, in chapter 16, I'm getting confused. Um, there is that um, point where Erastus and um, Sechulath are sitting around and talking, and Erastus is doing his Erastus thing and being an asshole, and Sech is not standing up to him, just like we remember from Dust of Dreams and everything. But Erastus is even more arrogant and dumb at this point. Um, so he, like, they decide that they need to flee after killing some Jaghut and being, and fucking around with Cruel's blood and all of that. And we're going to go into that in a minute. But my point is that they decide that they need to flee over the sea to the High Kingdom. And I think that this is obviously the Kingdom of the High King. Our good buddy Kalor, who seems to be a beloved ruler and everything. <clears throat> now, I know that when I remember the um, prologue to Memories of Ice, we see Kalor sitting on the ashes of his empire and all of that shit going on. And we see Dracodus and Karul and um, the sister of Cold Knights. Um, show up there and those I fear are the people who have like some of the largest grudges against um, Erastus and Sechulath so I think that that war against 
Calor's kingdom is somehow also to blame on Erastus, master dickhead of <laughs> the Malazan universe. Or at least one really high up there. Um, just a theory. I don't know if that will actually already happen in Fall of Light. I have no, no idea because I haven't read it yet. Um, just, you know, I when I like read that dialogue today between those two, and I'm like, oh shit, that's that's where this is going. I'm pretty sure Erastus has a hand in, like, Calor's fall. But, you know, we'll, we'll cross that ocean when we have to cross it. Um, just wanted to toss this out here. So let's get into more details and stuff. <clears throat> I really want to talk about this idea, the, the, that idea of how belief is formed and what belief entails and how belief is always about, you know, giving something up in lieu of um, safety, protection, whatever, um, or maybe not. Um, the idea that the Azathani are somehow spirits, whatever will, that can do all kinds of things, and that they can in some way, um, you know, take yeah, or use power. And the the point where um, uh, Karul, Karuli, <laughs> who then becomes Karul, which I found an interesting idea on, like, on how like language also works with that, <clears throat> gave his blood to form what we obviously know is going to be the Warrens later on, um, and gave, give that to everyone. There's a few things in there that I found interesting. One thing that those new forms of power are defined also by the people examining and like thinking and working with them so it's first of all it's just raw power and even through the through the um act of observing and um um yeah observing and maybe even using it it first you know gets firmer in its definition built out more, which, you know, makes a lot of sense when you compare it to, say, something else that being like, say, for example, science, where you start with like a vague idea and then it gets more and more specialized and formalized and whatnot. Um, but the idea that he basically gives that to everyone through his gift and that that is a problem in a way because... Um, for power to have, you know, to help those in power, they it needs to be rationed. It needs to be exclusive to some people, or some people have to have a, you know, better access to it to then enforce their power and privilege on those with less access to whatever gives them power. So the act of actually doing the thing he did, not being giving away his power to everyone, he, he questioned the established order of some people having power and there having to be a transaction between those of, who have power and those who want power in a way. He, he just questions or devalues that whole system. So there's that. And that, that obviously um, will lead to... Um, enmity from those who profit from that older system makes a lot of sense. Now we can compare that idea. This is sort of what I liked about it. This is like the... That idea to the fact that when we look at what is going on in Coral Galen with the Taist, that also is very much a question of like who has power, who has access to power, who, you know, and so forth. So we have the... Um, that thing that happens once again is like where we have two conflicts that are basically the same kind of conflict, just in different manifestations. We have the the the, the conflict of mundane power um, belonging to a privileged group. In this case, for example, the Tais noble, established noble houses, 
Um, and we have on the other side the question of magical power, that being the power of the Azathenai that is then given to every, potentially everyone for um, through Karuli's, now Karul's gift, that being blood. So that, I felt, is an interesting idea to look at, the, like, the conflict. And it's one of those things that I like so much about what I've read so far of the Carcanus trilogy, or, like, the first two, like, the first book of it, this being Forge of Darkness, is that so much of it, like, I mean, we always talk about these themes, but I, I really appreciate the fact that the question of power, um, power imbalance, um, economic imbalance, um, built in s systemic um, injustice and some systemic inequality is such a main theme here in the idea of rebelling at it, against it or how we deal with such like innately um, unjust and um, stratified systems I, I just really appreciate that is what i'm trying to say here um what else we get a lot more jaghut action and i just love jaghut we finally meet gothas the lord of hate and <laughs> yeah he's 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 still gothas I, I like that um we also finally get to meet hood so i'm, I'm happy about that as well Let's see where all of that is going. Obviously, we also... Um, the puppets. I feel that's sort of interesting, because I guess that's sort of... The point that the puppets that he gave to... That Verandas gave to... Um, how to, to give to Korea Turn out to be the bowls brothers or whatever you have them in the like Malazan universe and the ones he makes when they come to his tower are um, the Nacts whom we also meet later on which you know is cool um, so you know these like things that you can only appreciate when you have read the Malazan Book of the Fallen um, are cool on the other hand I just wonder how it feels to first read Carcanus and then go to the Malazan Book of the Fallen and understand all the things in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. It's like, it works both ways, I feel. Um, but let's not go too, too much into that thing. Um, what else? Draconis. Um... And the things that are leveled against him or not. The idea that Draconis is very much dealing in symbols, gestures, acts of like, but like transactional gestures. He does something for love. He tries to get everything right, to fix everything that is broken. And there's a few like really important questions asked. It's like, if something is broken, even if you can't fix it, does the act of trying, does that already count? Is that important, or is does that not is that not important? I personally believe that yes, it is important that you still try. But that's uh, that's another thing. Um, I just. Um, Feel that with Draconis, we see someone who is so much wrapped up in himself, and there's certainly an act of like an aspect of self righteousness to his character that I, um, yeah, it's there. Um, but there's still more, right? He seems to really love um, Mother Dark, and he does these things for love, like he feels that he has to give something like physically almost as a as a like sign for his love a token for his love and through giving um there's that exchange that he has with um with Erethan on the giving of gifts that kind of goes in that direction obviously where giving a gift um becomes something less than just giving a gift if you want to call it less at that point when it becomes sort of a need and 
the need to continue that gift giving or whatever. And that, I guess, is maybe the problem with someone like Draconis. Now, the interesting thing there is that <laughs> Draconis being an Azathenai, as is sort of established at this point, and <laughs> Azathenai being unique, each of them, more unique than, say, um, Tice. Now, obviously, everyone is an individual, so we're all unique. That makes a lot of sense. But they are, like, even more, like, individually unique with very specific aspects and whatnot. Now, the problem is, could something like love, like mutual love and respect and so forth, can that actually be when you have, like, such differences? Because... I guess the idea there is um, there will always be s such a huge inequality between the people, like a, a an imbalance between two people that it's very difficult to have that kind of love without, you know, something that Draconis tries, that being, um, you know, giving gifts and, and whatnot to establish like some kind of bond in a way. So there is, there's that to think about. And I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. Um, but this is the the other really important thing there. Um, we obviously come to that fateful thing where Hood decides to make war against death. And Arathon says that he doesn't believe that he will win, but he still applauds the effort. And I feel this is important. This is really important because the idea of death from a living person like what we do and this you know comes once again back then later to like stuff that we see in the Manasseh Book of the Fallen especially when we have this like inside look at Dead Mill, the, the, the necromancer um, the idea that all existence basically is at war with death in a way it's a war that we can't win so that's how natural laws work um, but it's still something that we need to do, because giving up would, you know, not be a good a good idea, <laughs> at least on a species-wide level. Um, so yeah, that's that's something that I just found really powerful. It's like, yeah, I need to do this now. I will go against death and fight against the injustice of death, <sighs> which, you know also explains why he is so dissatisfied with his job later on. Um, what else was there? It was a discussion on like the problems of civilization that you know, that civilizations and progress, how they work, and that um, when, when when civilizations stop progressing and are regressing and falling apart. And I like that point where, I think it is Hout or Korea, in their discussion when they say that one of the advantages or like the, the strengths of civilization is that it gives us the time for learning and studying for education. And that being a protected space where we can figure out shit. And this is like this is in theory at least true, which makes you know all the fuck ups we do with our education systems so highly problematic because education, that, that time of education should be exactly that. It should be a place where kids, young adults, whatever you want to call them, like growing human beings can figure out what, like, you know, learn things in a safe environment, figure out who they want to be in a safe environment. So us adults, or you adults, depend. I mean, obviously I'm, not, I'm, I'm an adult, totally. Um, <laughs> us encroaching on that, making, like, policy decisions on education, with all the, the fucked up things we do nowadays when we try to... Um, and you know, use you know either save money, make it make it economically viable, or put political uh, messages in there. 
And I'm not going to go into like finger pointing and whatnot. I have opinions on that, but they neither here nor there. The point being here is that that's not what education should be. Education should be a safe space for people to develop and become themselves. And um, yeah, I found that like, an interesting thing said on the side and it just, you know, fits in with a lot of the other themes of like, of the Malazan world and that time, like that, that emphasis placed on the importance of safe and um, nurturing childhood. Um, yeah. What else? Um, we see the border swords returning. We see Rind, Rind full of rage. <clears throat> that was like a powerful scene when they tried, when they decide to bury, uh, Gas Gaston? I think that's his name. Sergeant? Yeah, that guy. When they dis talk about how to bury him when they bury him the idea of um, rage of who takes advantage of whom and all of that um, I feel the important thing here is that that pile up of rage that we see in someone like Rin right he's he's frustrated for all kinds of reasons and we see all of them coming into a head at the end, when he figures out, like, when we, when we learn on the side that he apparently has been an abusive husband, he attacks and rages at his wife, and he realizing, like, all these things, how much of that is based on fear and all these other things, through sort of the strength of Ferrand, his sister, and, yeah, and then they come home to a burning town. And, you know, the amazing thing here is, and I feel like I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate what um, Stephen Erickson is doing here because it's something that he only, I feel, did maybe in Midnight Tides. <clears throat> that point where you see a, like, um, coming conflict and you have both sides or have at least some like insight into both sides but here it's even crueler right you see you see all those legion people doing all that bullshit you know dressing up and trying to raise like everyone against everyone to achieve their like goals and it works it all works <laughs> it ain't that fucking frustrating to read it's like yeah fuck Makes me so angry. <laughs> it makes me really angry. Now, once again, I I found interesting there. There is a, like a lot of interesting aspects in that as well. Like I mean, apart from just the violence and shit, um, what I found interesting was on the one hand um, the point once again of that dude whose name's maybe Narat, something like that. Narat, I think, the beat up guy. Um, who is still like very much dwelling over that whole um, marriage rape scene and everything and then he decides to actually do something else because he doesn't want to be part of that and he just like it all plays out in his head while he's going through that village and kill, still killing everyone and I feel that's an interesting aspect where we see that um, the, the point is not only how we think because we can like build up all these imaginary worlds and dreams of what we will do and justify our future actions and everything and build all of that while still doing the complete opposite because of outside circumstances that are beyond our control that we will completely you know still continue to do like the bad things because we once we're deep enough in a specific rut in a specific hole it's very 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 difficult to actually um, get out of there <clears throat> sometimes it's not it's impossible that's sort of the other part of that that we kind of need to you know accept in a way so I just found this interesting 
Because on the one hand, it shows that even, at least, some people who commit atrocities afterwards also still have some vestige of a conscience and suffer from that. I guess that's that's an important aspect that we see in the aftermath of warfare everywhere. That um, even like that like combatants that committed atrocities will also suffer from the trauma. Now I, I'm not saying we should like, you know. This is not a like r relativistic thing where you say, yeah, but you know, <laughs> the murderer also suffers. The <laughs> the violent person also suffers. That makes it better. No, it doesn't make it better. It just means that when we have to deal with people that have committed such things, and for example, after warfare, especially in you know civil wars, and this is a civil war, which makes it so much more brutal. Um, after those are over, we need to accept that there is, even though there may be a clear delineation between, you know, perpetrators and victims in a lot of cases, this doesn't mean that the perpetrators come out of this unscathed, in a way. And this is incredibly important when you talk about how, like, what to do once a conflict is no longer, like, fully violent. <laughs> It, it that's like super important to keep in mind that you know when you try to impose peace or like establish a civil society afterwards it means that you need to understand that those people that perpetrated like crimes crimes of war in this case and atrocities they will also suffer from what they did at least some of them maybe a lot of them um which you know doesn't make anything they did better that's not the case, but it still need, needs to need, needs we need to take that into account, and they are still due <coughs> some compassion or whatever for the um, for their suffering and their trauma, up to a point, obviously. Um, so I found that interesting to have that insight into his uh, into his head, even while he was still committing murder and slaughter. Another interesting thing was that um, um, meeting between the Border Swords and the Jellican, who, um, when they give them the antelope and they eat together and they have that argument there. <laughs> what I like about that, or what I find interesting about that, is like it clearly mirrors, you know, things that you have in like. Um, the Americas with um, indigenous population that are pressed back, and then you have these people on the side, the border swords in this case, you know, being like, yeah, but we need to eat, so we hunt all the shit that, you know, the jelly can need it before, and even though we have like, like you know, that problem that encroaching with like needs that can can't be fulfilled in that way by just hunting. Um, and having a superior military force, <laughs> they just, even after a peace, or a so-called peace was negotiated, they still go and do things that will further, you know, endanger, harm, and finally, ultimately destroy the Jellicum. So, which once again raises that question that was also sort of raised in, um, in Midnight Tides, like, what incentive is there for a an indigenous or group or a group that is militarily and like clearly uh, the lesser power uh, can you know but also economically the lesser power what incentive is there for them to actually um, you know negotiate a deal negotiate it for peace because the peace will still lead to their like because peace will still lead to their annihilation in the long run either culturally or actually literally in some cases the question there is like why wouldn't they just go all in and destroy everything because where's where's the incentive there so yeah i feel that once again we see with the tice society that 
we see that Thai society is a problematic society in a lot of ways. It's a feudalistic society, a feudalist society, which has all kinds of problems by itself. Um, it has a it is a pre-industrial, almost industrial society that is based based on continuous growth and expansion. Hence, you know, chopping down all the forests, hunting, over hunting all the beasts and so forth. So they're sort of on, the, on like the same direction that we are as humans nowadays. Another thing that I just came up today when I was thinking about it is like that you have this idea of... Um, a standing army, the being Urisander's legion, and that legion taking on itself a much stricter interpretation of religious faith, that faith being the faith of Mother Dark, than the nobles who are also obviously technically faithful to Mother Dark. Which kind of reminded me of something that you could also see, like a tendency that you can see in in a way, um, uh, the early modern times in Europe with upcoming more radical interpretations of Christianity. I'm not saying look at the uh, English Civil War, but look at the English Civil War. You could totally try to make parallels or take some inspiration from Urs Sanders' Legion with like the New Model Army in a way, if you want to. Or you also have like a an army led by um, landed gentry in that case in England, um, <laughs> unhappy with the distribution of wealth and power, and espousing a much stricter interpretation of the local religion, that being non-conformist Protestant um, Christianity compared to the Church of England laissez-faire Protestant Christianity in a way um, that is espoused by the nobility in England and then we get a civil war and oh boy wasn't that fun um, spoiler, it wasn't fun and it also didn't really work out but we, we'll see where that is going Anyway, I feel I've missed a lot today, but as I said, it was a mentally exhausting day, so I'm sorry that I probably forgot a lot of things. Anyway, I'll be back tomorrow with the rest of Forge of Darkness, and maybe I'll remember shit that I forgot today, and we'll wrap it all up tomorrow, and then stuff will happen, and I have ideas on how to deal with the God is not willing from next Thursday onwards. We'll see how long that will take. <laughs> anyway, have a great Thursday. That's in one week. All right. Um, have a great um, Thursday, and I'll talk to you tomorrow about Forge of Darkness. And then I have other ideas as well. So until then, cheers. <laughs>